Hello and welcome to Glass Tire. This is another edition of uh, Checking In With, and I am Christina Reese, and I am here with artist Celia Everly. Hello, Celia. Hey, Christina. It's sure good to see you. Oh my gosh. It's so nice to see faces. And one of my favorite things about Checking In With videos is I'm getting to talk to people I haven't seen in a while. I think that's true for all of us. And you know I love you, and we go way back, and we are friends, and it's incredibly nice to see your face and hear your voice. So, hello. I love you, too. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, really. I mean, um, things are not too bad here. I'm used to being sort of isolated, so yeah, and, and I need to be isolated to work, so... You do. And so for our audience, um, Celia is, um, she's a Texas born, Texas based artist. She's one of the artists we chose in the Texas wide um, auction that we were putting together for our gala. She gave us this, these incredible bats. I, I will show you pictures on screen of these things. We love them. And, um, and we worked with Chris Worley's gallery uh, as well for these. And um but you live in Ennis, Texas. You live kind of on a compound, more in a, and it's about, what is it, about 40 miles south of Dallas? Yes. Okay, so tell us about where you live and who you live around and what your homestead situation is like. So we went in with uh, Tom Sale and Dottie Love to uh, purchase uh, several acres here, uh, just outside of Ennis, it's close to Lake Bardwell. Mm -hmm. and uh, then Tom's parents moved out here. So Tom's parents live on one side of us, and then uh, Tom and Dottie live on the other side. And Dottie has cattle, which she runs on the property, and we have chickens. And so we're just living the farm ranch, whatever you want to call it, life, as well as, as, well as being artists. And uh, we all get together and talk and occasionally have meals together. So... Uh, it's nice and it's good to have people that you know and can rely on. And, and so we support each other basically. Yeah. And what, and I've been to your house several times. And so Tom and Dottie are on one side and then Dr. Sale and Teal Sale are on the other side. Are you seeing much of them during, I mean, they're pretty close. Are you seeing them? Yes. Yes. Especially Rick and Teal. We check on them regularly and you know, get things for them, run errands for them when we can so that they don't have to try and get out too much. Yeah, that's and, great. Uh, and just for yeah. reference uh, for the people listening, uh, Dr. Richard Sale was my all-time favorite college professor. He's one of the reasons I'm a writer. So it's just this great sort of serendipity that he lives next door to you. So what is, so you've had kind of a, you've had a very active year up until the COVID stuff came in. Yes. Yes. Tell us about some of the shows that you've had, some of the exhibitions uh, recently, and what you've shown, and kind of the, what's been going on with that. Well, the most recent show was at UTA, and uh, that was a great show. Um, Benito Huerta curated it, and uh, he did just a marvelous job. I was really pleased with his selections and the way he presented the work, and I was in that show with Jill Bedgood, and and uh, it just had a great synergy, and um, I, I really am happy with the way that show turned out. It was it was great, and um, and it, it was great to have that particular uh, collection of works together that he chose. They were kind of surprising juxtapositions, and and so I saw some things in my work that I hadn't noticed before. So. Um, I didn't realize quite how stridently feminist I was <laughs> till I started trying to talk about the things that I, that were in the show. And I thought, wow, this is, this is very, very strident. And um, I try to mitigate my stridency with some humor or some beauty. And you so, do. but you, and yeah. you do, you do that successfully. And I've always seen a very strong feminist streak in your work, but it doesn't feel like a hammer. Well, good, good. Because as I was talking about it, I thought, <laughs> I'm really, I'm really beating the drum here, but I, it needs to be beaten. I mean, unfortunately, it constantly has to be beaten. So, well, uh, and to me also, there's always been a very strong tie-in of of, of uh, feminism and uh, and your concern about climate change and ecology and the earth, and these two really intertwine heavily in your work. 
it, it really does. Uh, it's, it's all basically the same thing when you get down to it. Right. Which is exploitation of mm -hmm. things that can be exploited by the powers that be. So you've got more kind of more than one studio set up. You've got a studio in your house, uh, in a kind of wing of your house where you do more of the dry stuff or the stuff that's not stone not too messy <laughs> right the not too messy and then you've got some outs you've got these outbuildings that tell us about your what you're working on and what what you're using uh well at the moment i have a commission that i need to finish and i'll be working in bone for that it's another wasp nest piece it's um for a particular client so uh as soon as i finish that i'm probably going to get to work in some wood and and some more bone. Um, I had this really large project that I've been working on literally for years that I was hoping to do uh, in August, but that's completely off now. And so I, I pull myself off of that. I want to do some things that are uh, directly in response to COVID. So um, I, I've been thinking about the sky falling and um, bone castles in the air which was something that I had done in the past. Those bone castles are beautiful. How different though would it be to address COVID in the work than what was also, you were also kind of working toward a sort of a party for the end of the world. I mean, basically a kind of yes. a, an apocalyptic feel to what you were working on anyway. Oh yes, yes, I, I was working on an apocalypse and this has just uh, accelerated, I think, the, the future that I was envisioning with my apocalyptic dance party. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, I, all my work comes from the same place ultimately and all of it could be talked about in general terms in the same way, I suppose. Um, it, it is uh, just... Uh, um, I think it's true. I think it's it's about the truth. And that's that's what I'm always trying to get at. And the truth may be brutal, it may be uh, ugly, but um, we have to face it. That's all there is to it. And Yeah, so, and how do you feel about art being one of the ways that people can take a harder look at things that they've been a little too scared to look at? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure that art can change things. Um, uh, I guess it's possible that someone would look at things differently after looking at a piece of art, if the art's really powerful enough. Um, but, uh, it, it's the only means that I have of communicating. It's the only way I feel I can personally connect to the world and, and i been somewhat successful doing it so that just you know reinforces my idea that I should keep doing it right you've always been um a, I mean you read the headlines you read the news really a lot um yes. yeah, how, I do. how I mean this may just be one of the most basic questions or how stressed out do you get or how anxious do you get I've always been stressed out and anxious <laughs> I've been expecting a couple, an, um, an apocalyptic scenario for a long time. And even though the dance party was not specifically about a pandemic, it was more about the gradual process of humans being uh, usurped by artificial intelligence. Um, still, I think this could, you know, make that happen even quicker. And, um, I, I, th I think we we're just we're paying our dues. This is this was coming. It's been coming for a long time. We didn't necessarily have to know what shape it was going to be in. It could have been in any form, but it's been coming. It's 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 something that that we're having to to experience because these kinds of things always happen. I mean, historically, it's part of the human experience. I think that you have sort of exceptional antenna or radar and I feel like your work has often been somewhat prescient or at least as you're saying it gets to the truth but it gets to it through these kind of interesting rounds and I guess um I guess I'm wondering what do you think the world is gonna look like in six months or a year or in two years well I think 
I mean, <laughs> I almost hate to express what I think because it is sort of distressing, but, um, you know, we've only nominally had a democracy for at least as long as I've been alive, or at least as long as I've been adult enough to, to understand it. And I think we'll have, before long, we'll have an outright oligarchy. That's what I'm, I'm afraid of the most, is it will just be an out, outright oligarchy and people won't have any choice because they have been so completely eviscerated by the last downturn and, and uh, the current circumstance. Be a middle class anymore. Um, the, the ones that are just below the 1%, they will functionally be the middle class after this, I think. Uh, how will our economy function without um, consumers? That that's a big question for me. Like, how are we gonna how are we gonna go forward with any kind of economy? Will will money matter? Will will money become so superfluous because of the fact that they're just printing tons of it, basically and giving it to the few? Um, will we? even be able to afford the things that we need. Uh, I think it's possible that we will have a universal basic income for some people, but uh, it probably won't be enough to live on. So uh, those are all very harrowing things to, to consider. And um, I, I think we have a lot of cataclysms ahead of us basically. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is the work that you've given us for, for our auction, which uh, we have three of your bats and we're big fans at Glass Tire. We're big fans of your bats. And, um, and I think it's interesting how the bats tie into the COVID uh, situation and the wet yes. and the, the way that animals and humans are not meant to have mixed in this particular way that has been sort of rammed through. What, uh, tell us about your bats. Um, the bats uh, are, are part of an idea that I have about animism, uh, basically. Uh, even though I grew up in the pine forest, uh, when I saw the black forest for the first time, I was really struck by the fact that it was just this entity you know, and I, and I started to think about how nature really is a, a being that that really drove that idea home to me. And um, so so um, animistic ideas are very interesting to me and uh, thinking about nature perceiving us mm. as we per perceive it. And um, so when I, I was doing the mythology of love, I wanted to think about the concept of love and all the things that we associate with that concept. So um, I, I thought about jealousy. When I was a kid, I think this is in the early 60s, there was a song called The Night Has a Thousand Eyes, and it was about jealousy. And so jealousy was an aspect of love that I wanted to explore. And, I, and that idea that, that the night perceives you sort of played into the animistic idea. And so I just compressed those two things together. And so um, the idea that uh, a lover might have so much insight that, that they know what uh, the object of love is doing, <laughs> no matter where they are, <laughs> even in the dark of night. So uh, it's like having a godlike eye. I, I've never heard you say that. And I've never heard you talk about jealousy and about the, uh, you have a piece that you've had in your studio for a long time. If, if, if it's not at Chris's gallery and it's a, um, you know how much I love this piece. It's kind of like a large bear face and it has lots of eyes and it is as black as night. Um, is jealousy for you almost more, when you talk about the animus of jealousy and the kind of the monolithic entity of nature, is jealousy, is it more of like an academic interest to you? Is it a personal interest to you? Are you driven by it? Have you just, are you driven, are you just interested in the 
the force that it can have or the impact that it can have on human behavior? Like what, what is, what well, you- yeah, jealousy is a big thing, I think, in a lot of, of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, careers, but well, a lot of circumstances, no matter what they are. I mean, but uh, jealousy plays a role in art, in art careers. I mean, people can't help but look at someone else's success and say, oh, that should have been me. (laughs) And I think we all probably do it. We're all victims of it, but we have to overcome it because it's not productive. But um, uh, it's something I try to push aside as much as possible personally. I mean, I try to really push it aside because I do think it's it's not healthy. But um, I think women probably experience the impact of jealousy a lot more in their uh, daily lives, in their careers, because um, women are hard on each other, very hard on each other. Um, And in terms of the the aspect of love, I mean, jealousy is one of the most destructive things to a relationship that could possibly happen. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And some people use jealousy. They think that it it proves that the, you know, the other person loves them more. And I've always thought that was (laughs) a very negative approach to uh, the the idea that, that, the other person loved you because they they were jealous or resentful of anything else that happened to you. I think multiples are a way of trying to create more impact. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not really equipped as an artist to, to make really huge things. I would like to make bigger things, but it's you not. You've made some pretty big things. I mean, you filled up that whole silo down in Houston uh, not yes. long ago. Yes, but I would like to make even bigger things. <laughs> I once made an entire installation, uh, filled up an entire gallery, and it was called The Bowels of God, and it was something that people could walk through. It was a big two-story maze. One thing that's, and I think if people are not familiar with your work, although I think probably a lot of people watching this would be, but one thing that has always struck me about you um, more than almost any artist I know in Texas, although some other artists work this way, is that you really do come up with the thing you want to communicate and then you figure out how to make the thing that does that. And if that means teaching yourself an entirely new, incredibly complex skill, you do it. I'm good at (laughs) self-abuse. It's incredible because almost every time I've done a studio visit with you or something, you're having to teach yourself a whole new way of making things, of making art. Recently, you started to get into animatronics, which you had not done before. But I mean, carving and ceramics and glazing and, and and doing things with all these different kinds of stone and bone and would, I mean, it's, it's, it's mind boggling and it really is, you 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 just figure out the vehicle that's going to best do what you need it to do. Yeah, that's what I try to do. I try to make the material part of the uh, message. Uh, to me, that's very important. I feel like that the material is integral to the meaning of the work. So if you, we're going to have uh, an exhibition, say, around the new year. What do you know what it would be? Well, it would probably be the sky is falling <laughs> or the sky has fallen. It's probably that the sky has fallen, actually. So what do you miss? So, I do miss getting to go to Dallas. I miss half price books. I miss going and foraging for art supplies. Um, certainly miss going to uh art openings because i enjoyed that enjoyed seeing everything that was going on uh i had my calendar full of things that i wanted to attend Mm. and those are gone so um you know uh uh it's heartbreaking but uh it's not totally unexpected because before this happened I was talking to my husband and we were saying something really awful is going to happen. 
because there's nobody driving the bus. That's right. On that I note, I want to say, please be safe. Obviously, I know you will be, but I, we miss you. I miss every. I miss you. I miss everybody. I miss people. I do too. I do too. I miss being able to get together with everybody and um, give hugs. And <laughs> And thank you so much. On behalf of Glass Tire, thank you for the bats. We love the bats. It's my pleasure and my honor to do that. Thank you. Oh my God, we love them. Okay, so I will stop recording, although we don't have to hang up, but I'm going to stop recording. Okay. So, bye, audience. <laughs>